Here's a great story. There was once a man in Omaha who owned and ran a successful soap company. And when he died, his business was sold for $300,000. Now, this was in the middle of the depression in the 30s. So when his late wife received this money, she went from an already very wealthy woman to the wealthiest woman for miles around. $300,000 back then is the equivalent to about $5 million in today's money. But she no longer had a husband bringing in the funds that she'd been accustomed to, or a successful soap empire to lean on if her heating bills went up 70%. The next set of decisions she would make with this cash were probably the single biggest decisions she had ever made, or will ever make again in her life. She absolutely had to get it right. So what's the first thing she decided? Well, she decided that she didn't need any advice. No investment advice, no financial advice, no professional input whatsoever. Instead, this is what she did. She simply took that money and she split it into five chunks. And each chunk she invested into just one stock. So that's the equivalent of $1 million in today's money in each stock. $5 million spread across just five stocks. But it's what she did next that's perhaps most fascinating. Nothing. She did absolutely nothing. When she died 20 or so years later in the 1950s, her stock portfolio was worth $1.5 million. That's about $18 million in today's money. A seriously brave lady, or perhaps stupid depending on your point of view. She reaped the rewards of having high conviction in her stock picks. Not only did she ignore traditional advice on eggs and baskets, she threw away the basket and ate the eggs. So what's the lesson here? Should we be ditching the global index funds, kicking Jack Bogle to the curb in favour of just choosing a handful of stocks? That story was first told by Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's right-hand man at Berkshire Hathaway. Charlie's own father was actually the lawyer to that man from Omaha, and Charlie himself was involved in administering that lady's estate when she later died. The reason he was telling that story was to make the point that, in his opinion, diversification is not all it's cracked up to be. And that opinion is straight from the Buffett playbook, who once described diversification as a protection against ignorance. So why is it then that the two most experienced investors are telling us the complete opposite to every finance class and textbook that's taught throughout the Western world? I mean, you look up investing for beginners anywhere on YouTube or any article, and you'll find a discussion about eggs and baskets not too far from the top. But whilst they are telling us to spread our eggs, eggs, not legs. <laughs> Buffett and Munger are suggesting we ought to just have a handful of dinosaur eggs that we can barely sit on. I guess the wealthiest people in the world don't diversify. I mean, have a look at Jeff Bezos's Amazon position and Elon Musk's Tesla position as examples. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. All You Can Eat. How's it going? Nothing magic. We like to put a lot of money in things that uh, we feel strongly about. And that gets back to the diversification question. Uh, we think diversification is, as practiced generally, makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Diversification is a protection against ignorance. I mean, if you want to make sure that nothing bad happens to you relative to the market, you own everything. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a perfectly sound approach for somebody who who does not feel they know how to analyze businesses. If you know how to analyze businesses and value businesses, it's crazy to own 50 stocks or 40 stocks or 30 stocks probably, because there aren't that many wonderful businesses that are understandable to a single human being in all likelihood. And to have some super wonderful business and then put money in number 30 or 35 on your list of attractiveness and forego putting more money into number one just strikes Charlie and me as madness. And it's conventional practice, and it, you know, if all you have to achieve is, is average, uh, it may preserve your job, but it's a confession, in our view, that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Think of it this way. Let's pretend from time to time that I had some good ideas. I mean, you've only got to look at this YouTube channel to see that sometimes I have good ideas, 
and sometimes I have not so good ideas. Remember the lipstick? Christ. But if I've got a lump of money, and let's say I've got 30 great ideas or 30 great businesses that I've identified, in order of greatness, one being my absolute home run and 30 being my 30th best idea, then why on earth wouldn't I just put more money into my greatest idea, my number one draft pick, instead of my 30th best idea? In fact, Warren says all you need is six. Going into a seventh instead of investing more money into your best idea is a terrible mistake. Not many people got rich off their seventh best idea. And when you frame it like this, it seems to make sense. But the problem with this argument is that it is assuming one very key ingredient, certainty. It's as if it's a nailed on certainty that these ideas are going to smash it out of the park and perform, when we all know in reality there is no certainty. Warren perhaps feels more certain than most, and perhaps for good reason given his skills, but I hate to tell you, even a Warren pick is no sure thing. Don't get me wrong, Warren's performance speaks for itself, and when all the investors are lined up on the sports hall wall waiting to be picked for your football team, you're going Buffett number one. Perhaps stick him in goal though. So it would be fair to say, if you looked at the holdings inside Berkshire Hathaway, Buffett's famous investment company, that you'd see that they just hold a handful of businesses. I mean, that's what you'd expect, right? We just heard from him himself that it makes no sense to hold 50, 40, or even 30 stocks. Well, Berkshire holds over 50 holdings, and that has confused a lot of people, as it appears on face value that they don't practice what they preach. So, do I need to own 28 stocks in order to you know, have proper diversification? You know, be nonsense. And within Berkshire, I could pick out three of our businesses, and I would, I would be very happy if they were the only businesses we owned, and I had all my money in Berkshire. Now, I love it the fact that we can find more than that, and that we keep adding to it. But three wonderful businesses. It's more than you need in this life to do very well. And uh, the average person isn't going to run into that. I mean, if you look at how the fortunes were built in this country, they weren't built out of a portfolio of 50 companies. They were built by someone who identified with a wonderful business. Coca-Cola is a great example. A lot of fortunes have been built on that. And there aren't 50 Coca-Colas. There aren't 20. If there were, it'd be fine. We could all go out and diversify like crazy among that group and, and get results that would be equal to owning the really wonderful one. But you're not going to find it. And the truth is you don't need it. I mean, if you, if you have a really wonderful business is very well protected against the vicissitudes of the economy over time and the competition. I mean, you know, we're talking about businesses that are resistant to effective competition. And three of those will be better than 100 average businesses. He touches on the Berkshire portfolio and actually says that he could pick three of the holdings and be happy with just them. So why doesn't he? Here's the portfolio and look, there's a few more holdings than just three. Interestingly though, he's got nearly half of it in Apple. That's a high conviction play. Nearly all of the other holdings are small, really small in most cases. So it begs the question, Warren, why, like you told us, are you putting money into your 50th and 51st best idea instead of just putting more money into your best idea? In this example, as you see it, Apple. Isn't that a complete contradiction of what you preach? Well, there is, in fact, a pretty plausible explanation for this. Size. Steady. <laughs> Warren looks after hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, according to that table, he's looking after $150 billion of cash alone. There's only so many positions where he compiles such large sums of money into. There's only so many companies that can take his large input. Steady. He's forced, therefore, to find new opportunities to sow his seed. In many ways, Warren's biggest problem is that he's got too much money. He's too big. Enough. Now, it's important to understand what they are not talking about. The first thing they're not talking about here is trading. They're not discussing the quick turnaround of stocks. They're talking about long-term investing. Stocks that they want to buy and hold for potentially forever not a stock they want to buy on a Monday, sell on a Tuesday. They're into long-term relationships, not one-night stands. Also, Buffett and Munger are not saying that diversification is a scam and no one should be doing it. Far from it. 
In fact, Buffett is quite famously quoted in saying that when he eventually keels over, he'd like his wealth placed in an S&P 500 tracker fund for his wife and family to enjoy. Why? Because they feel that diversification is for the know-nothing investor. I wonder if his wife knows how he thinks of her investment credentials. If you can't analyse businesses, then you should diversify and be happy with average returns. And index funds are one way of doing this. If we all had the acumen of Warren Buffett, then yeah, concentrating our portfolio in a few wonderful opportunities seems to make sense. But how many of us are Warren Buffetts? Most active funds don't even beat the market. What does that tell you? Professional stock pickers can't even do better than the market, let alone the average in most cases. What's funny is when you look at most indexes, you'll actually see that very often 75% of the stocks in the index actually underperform the average and it's 25% that deliver all the performance. So with that in mind, all you'd need to do is actually pick the stocks in the top 25% and you'd murder the average performance of the index. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Except people still can't do it, at least not consistently. Ooh. And here's the thing. Little sound bites like this from Buffett or Munger are really easy to sort of get sucked into. I mean, you know, Buffett, he speaks so well, he's such an interesting guy and his performance speaks for itself. But he's making something that is almost impossible sound quite straightforward. I'm a financial advisor. I diversify my clients' investments and my own family's investments are all diversified. It's how I sleep at night. I guess if you were to line me up on the sports hall wall with Buffett and Munger either side, you're not picking me for your football team. There's a game I'd pay to watch. Seriously though, are you picking two old rich dudes over a strapping young lad like me for your football team? I mean rich dudes anyway, they're the enemy, right? Hmm, I think you should watch this video next. It might just change your mind. <laughs>